Good afternoon. Welcome to this week's HPL seminar. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Chan. Uh, Amanda is a uh, master's student with Dr. Tannen Schmidt. She's worked with Dr. Schmidt since the second summer of her undergraduate studies in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, her research focuses on uh, interactions between biological surfaces with a particular focus on contact lenses. Uh, she hopes to wrap up her uh, master's work in the next six months and defend her thesis. Now, aside from her work with contact lenses, uh, Amanda's done some very interesting work uh, looking at uh, scoliosis patients with Alberta Health Services. Uh, here she's used imaging techniques to help design braces for these patients. Now, an interesting fact about Amanda is that she's a talented musician. Uh, her favorite instrument to play is the gitalele. This is a combination between a guitar and a ukulele. Now, despite her instrumental proficiency, uh, Amanda uh, elected to give today's seminar as a a cappella presentation, and she's going to be presenting her master's work <laughs> investigating the effect of proteoglycan 4 on the kinetic coefficient of friction of commercial contact lenses. And are you ready? Awesome. Thanks, Ian. So there are over 140 million people in the world who wear contact lenses. Unfortunately, a lot of these contact lens wearers suffer from signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. So this could cause discomfort, dryness, redness in the eyes, or even uh, visual disturbances. Dry eye disease affects over 30 million North Americans, and it is believed that contact lens usage actually induces dry eye disease. So this has led to a reduced use of contact lenses and even discontinued use of contact lenses. So when we blink, there are significant frictional forces that act on the cells of the ocular surface, as well as our eyelid. Now, when we wear contact lenses, these frictional forces are actually even higher. So this is important because contact lens friction is the strongest indicator of contact lens comfort. So this means that the lower the friction of a contact lens, the more comfortable it is to wear. So currently in the contact lens industry, there's no industry standard to measure in vitro friction of contact lenses. There has been a couple studies, such as one where they used mucin coated glass um, and rubbed that against contact lenses. So that's shown in the figure here. Um, however, um, glass is a hard surface and it doesn't reflect the mechanical properties of human eyelids. So there is a desire among the research com uh, community um, and also of contact lens manufacturing companies to find a way to measure the coefficient of friction both precisely and accurately, given that now we know the important correlation between contact lens comfort and contact lens friction. So soft lenses dominate the contact lens um, market nowadays. So there's two main types of contact, soft contact lenses, conventional hydrogels as well as silicone hydrogels. Conventional hydrogels are mostly hydrophilic, but they have a low oxygen permeability. On the other hand, silicone hydrogels have uh, silicone in them, and they are more hydrophobic, but they have a higher oxygen permeability. So silicone hydrogels are the most popular types of contact lenses on the market today. In Canada in 2015, it's estimated that 72% of all soft lens prescriptions are of silicone hydrogels. So if anyone here wears um, any contact lenses, chances are you might see it among one of the brands listed right here. So proteoglycan-4, or PRG4, also known as Lubricin, is a mucin-like glycoprotein that has been discovered naturally on the eye. So that's seen in red in this uh, figure right here. So you can also see in this picture, this is uh, two pictures of mice, mice eyes. Uh, one here is the, the top one here is the wild mice, and you can actually see uh, evidence of PRG4 on the eye, whereas here without... Um, in mice that is knockout, PRG4 knockout, you can see ocular surface damage on the eye. So you can see the importance of PRG4 here. So in our lab, we've shown that PRG4 is an effective ocular surface boundary lubricant. Uh, previous work done by a PhD student, Michael Sampson, has shown that PRG4 reduces friction between human eyelids and commercial contact lenses. So uh, this is uh, one of the graphs of his work. So we have kinetic friction on the vertical axis and also the sliding velocities uh, on the horizontal axis. And what he did was he compared a, a contact lens called AccuView Oasis with and without PRG4. 
So if you look at this line here, this is without PRG4, and it has significantly higher friction compared to lenses that have PRG4 in it. So recently, we've uh, been able to re receive recombinant human PRG4 expressed from Chinese hamster ovary cells, the cell line. And so this is important because now we are able to um, use this PRG4 clinically in humans. So indeed, uh, we are, we've been actually doing that. Uh, there's been a recent clinical trial, a two-week clinical trial, comparing RH-PRG4 eye drops against HA eye drops in patients with dry eye disease. And so what we found from this trial was that PRG4 was able to uh, significantly improve signs and symptoms of dry eye disease when compared to HA. So this is really promising, and it shows that there's potential for clinical use of RHPRG4. Now for our lab, we're interested in seeing how this RHPRG4 can be incorporated with contact lens usage. So there are three different ways that we can go about incorporating RHPRG4 usage into contact lenses. So the first is a overnight soak solution. So for those of you who wear contact lenses, um, what you typically do at night you take off the contact lenses, you wash it, and you put it in a saline soaking solution. So we could incorporate PRG4 in this overnight soak solution. However, this, um, this option is quite uh, expensive because of the large quantities of RH PRG4 needed. Another option is a lens coating. So we can actually um, coat, uh, use RH PRG4 to coat the lens or, um, yeah, so, but we found that there might be an issue with this option because when uh, in the manufacturing process of contact lenses, the last step is to sterilize contact lenses by autoclave. So this is high heat, 121 degrees for 30 minutes. Now, RHPRG4 is a protein, and we think that this can actually denature the protein during this autoclave process. And lastly, um, eye drops. So we've talked about that before. So there's a potential that using RH PRG4 eye drops um, could be, this could be used with contact lens usage as well. So we decided to take a closer look into uh, the RH PRG4 coated contact lenses and to see if autoclaving PRG, RH PRG4 will actually affect its lubrication properties. So over the summer, we did a series of tests comparing autoclave PRG4 and non-autoclaved RH PRG4. So here uh, we have the kinetic coefficient of friction and different lens testing um, conditions on the bottom here. So the exact methodology of this test will be explained later on in the presentation. But if you focus on the red box here, we have autoclave PRG, RH PRG4. So what we did was we soaked lenses in RH PRG4 overnight, and then we autoclave them um, right before testing it in saline. And we compared this to non-autoclaved RH PRG4. We can see here that although there's not a significant difference between these two, um, there is a trend towards having higher friction when the RH PRG4 was autoclaved. So um, from these tests, we decided to pivot away from looking at RH PRG4 as a lens coating and focus on our two other remaining options. So this would be the overnight soaking solution where we um, incubate RH PRG4 um, lenses in the RH PRG4 and also the eye drops where we instantly incubate um, right before testing. So this brings me to the main question of my thesis. How does different lens types, different lubricants and different lens incubation times affect the RH PRG4 lubrication? So the overall goal of my thesis is to understand which commercial lenses are compatible with RH PRG4 for friction reduction as a first step towards clinical use of RH PRG4. My hypothesis is that the incubation of lenses in RH PRG4 will result in a rapid adsorption of protein and a reduction of friction, even when it is tested in lubricant baths that are devoid of RH PRG4. So these are the materials I use for my testing. So first of all, cadaver human eyelids donated from the UFC body donation program. So yes, this means going to the anatomy lab in Foothills and cutting eyelids off dead bodies. So that's a, definitely an interesting experience. Um, also phosphate buffered saline, uh, PBS. So I'll refer to that as saline throughout the presentation. 
We also receive batches of RHPRG4 from the company Lubris, and Peregrine is a company that actually manufactures these batches of RHPRG4. And lastly, different contact lenses, AccuView Oasis, Biofinity, and ProClear. So you may ask, why did I choose these three specific lenses? Well, AccuView Oasis and Biofinity are both types of silicone hydrogel lenses, and they're both manufactured by different companies. They have different technologies um, and lens designs, such as for AccuView Oasis, there's an internal wet wetting agent uh, using polyvinyl pyrrolidone, or PVP, whereas uh, Biofinity uses a technology called Aquaform. We also decided to use a conventional hydrogel lens called ProClear. This is an interesting lens because it is the only lens that is FDA approved for dry eyes. So we thought this would be interesting to see how um, we can incorporate RHPRG4 with this contact lens to see if, how it uh, affects the lubrication. So friction testing was um, carried out using the BioMomentum Mach 1 machine. So we are able to articulate um, two surfaces against each other using this machine. So to set up this machine, what we did was we cut out a little piece of eyelid and we mounted it on a custom eyelid holder. And at the same time, we mounted contact lenses on a custom contact lens holder. And then we put a silicone sleeve over it so, to create a lubricant bath. So this way, the lens is always in solution during testing. So this is what it looks like in the test setup. We have the eyelid on the top articulating at a sliding velocity of 0.3 millimeters per second against the contact lens. So this is what the machine looks like in action. So you can see the articulation there. So to calculate kinetic coefficient of friction, uh, we take the uh, torsional forces and also the normal forces, and we calculate an average of that, and we plot it on a graph where we um, put, we take five points. So this correlates to five tissue strains from one to 20 kilopascals, and we're able to fit a line through that and calculate the kinetic coefficient of friction. So this is the uh, derivative of the shear force over the derivative of the normal force. So as previously mentioned, there's lots of factors that affect um, the friction of lenses. So first of all, the different lens types we're using, um, also different lubricants. So the saline as well as the RHPRG4 uh, used at a concentration of 200 micrograms per milliliter, as well as the incubation time of the RHPRG4. So the instant drop um, where we uh, use, we just add RHPRG4 30 seconds before testing as well as the overnight soak, which could be 12 to 16 hours of soaking the lenses in RHPRG4. So this is my first test sequence. So this is uh, testing the soaking solution. So here in the arrow diagram, you can see that there's two solutions. So the first one is what we soak the lenses in. And in the brackets here, this is what we test the solution, test the lenses in. So first we start off with a precondition for the eyelid, just to make sure that um, the eyelid is clear of any debris. And then we start off with a negative control. So we first soak lenses and test them in saline. So saline can be shown here in blue. Next, we soak the lenses in RHPRG4, and then we test them in saline. So RHPRG4 is shown in yellow here. Lastly, we soak and test the lenses both in RHPRG4. So this is the first sequence where we soak solutions. Our second solution, our second sequence is quite similar. Um, everything is the same except for step three. Here we soak lenses in, uh, in saline, and then right before we test, we put three drops of RHPRG4 onto the lens, and then we wait 30 seconds, and then we um, test in saline. So that can be seen in the box right here. So I decided to start um, my test with this test sequence, and these are the results from my first uh, test with the RHPRG4 drops. So we used uh, the AccuView Oasis lens, and you can see that we have kinetic coefficient of friction again on the vertical axis and the different test solutions on the bottom. And what's interesting about these results is that it shows no significant difference in friction between the test conditions. So this was interesting because we've shown in previous work that RHPRG4 does reduce friction. So we kind of had to think about what, what could have happened during this test. So once again, we showed no measured difference in friction when 
RHPRG4 jobs were added. So we kind of got to thinking, what could have gone wrong? Was it the concentration of RHPRG4? Was that not enough? Because um, in previous tests with Michael Sampson, we did use 300 micrograms per milliliter, but here we used 200 micrograms per milliliter. However, in the clinical trial that I mentioned earlier, they only used a concentration of 150 micrograms per milliliter, and they showed an effect where it improved signs and symptoms of dry eye. So we decided to look at something else, um, the different RHPIG4 batches. So um, all the clinical work that we've done before with the clinical trial, as well as uh, previous published work, was actually using a clinical batch of RHPIG4, which has since run out. And so uh, the work I've been using, I've been doing, I've been using a new batch of RHPIG4. And so we decided to look um, more specific, specifically comparing the differences between these two RHPRG4 batches. So this is a protein stain that we did comparing these two batches. So you can see here on the left, this is the previous clinical batch, whereas now the batch I'm using is the current developmental batch here. And what you can see from this protein stain is that with the current batch I'm using, there's a lack of multimers of RHPRG4 multimers in solution. Now, this is interesting because a, another previous PhD student of ours, Salim Abubakar, had actually showed um, when he, he did his work, he compared solutions that are monomeric solutions versus the multimeric solutions of RHPRG4. And he actually found that uh, the multimeric solutions of RHPRG4 actually had a reduction in friction compared to the monomers. And he tested this in cartilage. So we think the same thing happened here um, and that the multimers are important in lens lubrication. So therefore, we decided to look with, uh, investigate further with a new batch of RHPRG4. So we recently had this new batch come in. It's a highly purified batch. And you can see here on the protein stain that there is both the presence of multimers and monomers. So we went ahead and did the exact same test with this new batch of RHPRG4. So this is the results with the new batch. Um, so once again, we tested with the AccuView Oasis, and we have um, the kinetic coefficient of friction and the different test conditions here. What we found was that there was a significant drop in friction once we added the RHPRG4 drops. So although it doesn't look like there's a huge drop in friction, it's around a 15% drop. And this is still significant because when we, use, when we have the clinical trial, they only use a concentration of 150 uh, micrograms per milliliter, and they were still able to show that um, having RHPRG4 actually improves signs and symptoms of dry disease. So it's important, uh, I think it's significant that here we show that um, adding RHPRG4 actually reduced friction in this particular uh, type of contact lens. So, the summary of my main findings so far, this is that the instant incubation of RHPRG4 reduced friction on the AccuView Oasis lens. We also found that it is important to have multimers in uh, the lens um, as it affects the lens lubrication. So in my future work, I'll be continuing my work and doing the SOAK solution um, test sequence, as well as completing all this work with the two other types of contact lenses as well. So the significance of all of this work is the potential application of eye drops for contact lens wearers. Ultimately, our goal is to commercialize RHPRG4 uh, to improve contact lens comfort and reduce dry eye disease in contact lens wearers. So I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Tannen Schmidt, Michael and Suresh, and the rest of the Schmidt Lab Group, the UOC Body Donation Program for the eyelids, and my funding sources as well. Thank you. Yeah, so I didn't mention this, but another part of my master's thesis is to do confocal microscopy. So we would fluorescently label the RHPIG4 and then um, fix it and 
uh, do the microscopy to see the actually see the pictures of the RHPRG4 and see if it actually adheres to the contact lens. So I haven't um, done this step yet, but we plan to do that as another confirmation. You've done a really nice job of controlling a lot of variables, but but I'm I'm curious when you take islets from the donor program, is that a source of variation that you could perhaps take out of your study? I, mean, I don't know what people's islets are like on the inside, but wouldn't there be potentially some people that have slippery islets and some that don't? I'm wondering yeah. why you don't use a piece of tissue, rabbit or or something else that's more more consistent. Yeah. Um, definitely. So that's something we've definitely talked about before. So when I get um, donors from the anatomy lab, I don't get to choose which, like what age they are, right? Usually they're very old, like I've had up to like 97 years of age eyelids and there could be a lot of wear on these eyelids. Um, and also that's, yeah, that's something we've definitely talked about and that's the novelty of our test, um, testing it against actual um, cadaver human eyelids. But um, we have considered this, and another part of my thesis um, to be done later is to look at a synthetic material um, to see if there's anything that we can that has similar mechanical properties to human eyelid that we can test to eliminate this variation in our test. But I've I haven't considered using like rabbit aorta or any type of other tissue um, instead of eyelids. So that's an interesting uh, option there. Well, the question is, is there actually any variability with your eyelids? There may not be. And, you know, perhaps there really isn't. And if you were to test it on another substrate, maybe you could show that your, that your eyelids are perfectly at eggshells. I'm just wondering if there is a variability. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do, when we do tests, we do like note down like which eyelid we used and the age and the gender and the cause of death and everything like that. And so far, we haven't found that any of those factors actually affect the outcome of the test, but there is definitely variability. Yeah, so our positive control for the test was soaking and testing the lenses in RHPRG4. So that was our positive control. And so far, it doesn't always show that it is lower in friction, but um, it's supposed to. Can you change the ratio of the monomer to the polymers? You said if they're pure monomer, they don't work. Um, yeah, we haven't tested only monomers, and I think what we get from, it depends on what we, the batch of RHPRG4 that we get from the company. Uh, I believe that there is a way of changing the ratio. So since in, with the previous student, uh, Salim, he was able to test only monomers versus only multimers. So there is a way of changing the ratio. Um, we just, we didn't, when I tested, I didn't change any of the ratios. I just tested what was uh, the batch where it was just naturally like that. So what is the difference mechanically between the monomer and the multimer? So we believe that the multimers, um, they're, they are, they, not, we're not quite sure like why, but the monomers, the multimers attach, adhere to the surface better than monomers. And so this actually affects the lubrication. What was below the, the lens? Was it on a like cow's eye with that strong kind of metal surface? So it was just a silicone holder. So it's something we just made out of silicone that had the shape of the lens so that we can just put it on top. Did the lens stick to it or was it sliding on top of it? We use crazy glue on we just put a couple drops of crazy glue on the side to just make sure that it stays onto the holder. few questions. So I wonder why you chose that 200, that concentration of 200 rather than what you previously had done or whether, you know, what the clinical concentration was. Um, there's a not a very scientific reason. That was when we were running out of the old clinical batch. So we thought that 200, uh, the concentration of 200 micrograms per milliliter would be sufficient 
to uh, see an effect in lens lubrication, seeing that the eye drops were only 150 and they showed uh, significant results. Oh, okay. And then, what did, this, what did your previous studies shown regarding when you combine HA with PRG4? Is HA combined with PRG4 lower in friction than PRG4 alone? Yeah, so previous work shown, showed that it was a synergistic effect, so adding them both together uh, lowered friction better than both of them alone. So why wouldn't you want to include that in a recombinant solution or, or an eye drop? Um, yeah, we talked about pos the possibility of that, but right now we were just focusing on this RH PRG4 alone to see what it can do, and then uh, future work could be to incorporate both of these together. And then in the, in the clinical study, is it just PRG4? Yeah, yeah. So the drops were just RH PRG4 drops and just HA drops. I have two questions. Uh, first one is when people are wearing contact lenses, is most of the irritation related to uh, the friction of contact lens over the eyelid, or is it also uh, the contact lens on the cornea? Um, we believe that it's mostly the eyelid and the contact lens because those are the two interfaces that are moving, whereas the contact lens isn't really moving that much on the cornea itself. My second question uh, relates to some of your introductory uh, work. Uh, so what's the significance of autoplaving and what do you think it does to uh, 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 care before and the ratio of multimers and monomers, or is it just holding a protein on what's happening right now? The significance of autoclaving is just a step in the manufacturing process. So just before they um, send off the contact lenses to uh, different areas, they do put it under uh, autoclave sterilization just to sterilize everything. And so um, we think that because RHPRD4 is a protein, that it will be denatured once it's um, sterilized under this high heat. So I don't think it affects the, um, has to do anything with the monomers and multimers, but just like, it just denatures the protein itself. Have you ran any gels to verify that? No, we haven't. Is there a, an allergic risk to using the protein? That's a good question. I don't believe so. I haven't heard about anything or read anything about allergies, but that's to my knowledge. Just to follow up on Ian's question, Lenny, could you go back to the figure where you showed the drop, you know, the, the drop in you know, frictional properties with bottle flavoring? With the three, sure. The three bars, and I broke, they went by quickly, and I didn't digest them. So why why is the third one even lower? Is that one that's, is that, that's, what's the difference between the second and the third bar graph? Yeah, so the important difference between the two is one had RHPRG4 that was autoclaved, so lenses were soaked in the autoclave RHPRG4, and then compared to the third one, it was not autoclaved. So this difference between this, these two bars are why is why we think that it is RHPRG4 is denatured. It's higher, yeah, but it's still lower than the soaking. Yes, that's true. But are you sure it's higher? Nope, it's not significantly different. We just see a trend towards it. And so um, we just think there's a potential of it being denatured. When, when you soak the lens in the, in the solution for a period of time, how long does the protein bind to the lens or how easily is it washed out afterwards? That's a good question. We don't know exactly which is uh, one of the questions of my thesis. It's like, um, will um, adding instant drops of RHPRG4 actually have an effect? Would it be like too quick, 30 seconds? But seeing that there is a difference once we add these drops, um, I believe that there's a rapid adsorption of the RHPRG4 onto the contact lens. Yeah, because another way I was thinking about making them deliverable is after the lenses were autoclaved, you could add them to a solution containing uh, the PRG4 for shipment. And then there's daily contact. You can just put them in right into the toss them out, but 
the amount of solution in here is fairly small. Mm -hmm. Would that work? Uh, well, usually, like the autoclave, the autoclave is like the last step in the manufacturing oh, so process. Oh, it's already autoclave with the solution. In yeah, it's, it's in the solution. Exactly, in the it's autoclave when they're already inside, like the singular so blister packages. So the coefficient of friction, I, I take it with all this uh, protein stuff, it's different from the, just the viscosity of the solution. Yeah. So there's something special about it. So the question is, what is special? What is special about the coefficient of friction? Well, it's just, so what is it about this protein that causes a lower coefficient of friction that's not related to just viscosity? So of course, you know, viscosity is a huge part of friction, but mm -hmm. apparently this is something else. Yeah, so we think it's a boundary lubricant. And so, um, we have a PhD student that's uh, looking into rheology and the viscosity of RHP84, whereas I'm looking specifically into the friction. And I'm not quite sure what's the major difference between the two. Scott? Here, you do mock one system and you can do the reciprocating sliding, which is really cool. Um, but with the, the bone system, you had that torsion that kept going, right? And then you knew that you were in boundary lubrication after so many cycles, or if I remember correctly. Here, since the contact lens and the eyelid and stuff are in, like a saline bath or PBS bath with whatever added, do you know that you're in boundary lubrication or are you in some in between hydrodynamic and boundary? And that leads into the question, when you actually blink, I think, I blink when my eyes start to dry out. Um, could maybe you simulate that? It'd be a lot harder to control, I think, on the Mach 1, though, rather than have it uh, submerged in a bath, but maybe put an eye drop in, wait a period of time, do a, a cycle, and then repeat that over and over again. It's more like, feel like actual blinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what um, Scott was talking about, our previous litter, or our previous work, we had a Bose biomechanical machine where we articulated lens and eyelid like uh, a torsional force. Whereas now with this new Mach 1, we're actually able to better simulate uh, blinking by articulating it like this. Sorry, what was your question? <laughs> Those are like two or three in there, but well, for, well first, maybe you're washing out the effect of the PRG4 binding to the surface and contributing to boundary lubrication by having constantly available PBS since everything's submerged in a bath. So mm -hmm. there might always be some hydrodynamic lubrication. I don't I don't know what the velocity you test at. So the differences between the coefficient of friction are not that like shocking like in the past in the with the Bose system, you had big differences between PBS and your lubricants, your PRG4 and hyaluronic and all that. I'm wondering if it's still dominated by fluid phase right. of lubrication. We believe that it's still in the boundary lubrication phase, okay. but I think that's a good question and we should definitely check to see um, if it's actually still in boundary lubrication. Yeah, and then the second point was just, could you, th do you think it would be possible to simulate a, a more realistic like blink? where you have the drying out phase, and then you blank and re-lubricate. Yeah, it's fluid. definitely possible. So we, we could take out the lubricant bath and just have it um, just, yeah, don't have a lubricant in it. Um, it might affect like the static coefficient of friction compared to the kinetic more. Uh, since you mentioned, what is boundary lubricant? That is a great question that I will need to go back and do more research on because I'm not quite familiar with the uh, two differences. Um, it has to do with uh, the fluid film having like a thin layer of fluid film, whereas boundary lubrication, um, it's the two surfaces actually um, having a interaction with each other. Can you go to the slide where you 
So you're trying to figure out what's going on. So the force in the y, which is your vertical direction, it starts out negative. So you have some sort of you bring it into contact, and so there's some force acting on it. And then and then you, you push it down, and then you bring the force back up, push it down, bring the force back up. But then the shear component kind of bounces between positive values and negative values. So why does it do that? Um, so when we do our testing, we articulate the lens, the eyelid over the lens at a 10 degree arc. So it goes positive 5, negative 10, plus 10, and negative 5 back to its original position. So I believe that um, that's what's causing the different, uh, so the Y force is the vertical, so that's causing the differences there. And then also the torsional, um, it's just the direction of where the eyelid is moving. Okay, yeah, I can. I have uh, two questions, depending on how you answer the first one. Um, do the mon monomers and multimers uh, degrade over time? So if you have this old batch, is it because they were uh, all there and then it was old, so they kind of went away? Or so were they just not there to start with? Um, yeah, so we we keep our RHPID4 in negative 80, and um, when we use it, we make a solution out of it, and we think it degrades after a day, so it's always kept in the fridge when we're soaking the solutions. So um, we do think that it uh, degrades over time for sure, um, but we don't know. We don't think that, like, um, because it's frozen, we don't think it degrades just, like, in the freezer like that. Okay, so um, in a practical sense, if you were to bottle this up and put it in stores or whatever for eye drops. Um, how long is the shelf life then? Or do you need to keep your eye drops refrigerated? Or how do you keep them from disintegrating and becoming something? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we haven't looked exactly into that. But um, from what it looks like here, if our HPID4 de degrades within 24 hours, then it needs to be kept in a fridge. And so that could be inconvenient for people who want to carry it in their purse and use it whenever, right? So yeah, that's a definitely good question that should be addressed during the commercialization process of how we can actually use this. Yeah, so you have to first, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. Nice. Thank you. Uh, our speaker next week is Ryan Riddick. He'll be presenting on the uh, multi-articular and deformable energetics of the running foot. Thank you all for coming and see you next week.